Well, amen? amen? All the time. And that just be the way it is, amen? amen. <clears throat> I want to touch on a little bit about last week. Um, teaching on being committed, commitment. And as I do quite often when I feel like I really hear from God on a word and I begin to examine that word a lot. Is there some other place that God wants to go with it? And this week I want to talk about how when we come to the place where we're totally committed how it begins to stir up the feathers of the enemy. Amen? When we're committed to the things of God, the devil don't like it. He raises his ugly head and begins to try to destroy you and your life. I say quite often, Satan don't care that you're saved. Because when you're saved, he can't do nothing about it. Amen? Amen? But when you begin to commit and begin to fulfill the purpose God has for your life, that's when the enemy steps in. That's when he begins to try to destroy you, tries to stop you, tries to maybe derail you or whatever the case may be. And so we must learn, you know, as quite often I, I, I say this, and I say it because I mean it, is I never want to come to a place in this ministry where I... I tell you that once you're saved and once you're committed, that everything is fluff and stuff. Amen? Because we must understand, when we begin to do the things God calls us to do, the enemy's going to do everything he can to stop you. Amen? Because if he can stop you, then he begins to stop other people. Because you're going to affect somebody else. Amen? Now, David talks about it. He speaks about being committed. But before I talk about that, I want to just talk about a guy by the name of Winston Churchill. And you've heard me say this before how he's preached this message. Actually, he spoke about this message at a college in, in uh, 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 England. And we talk about how he got up and he said, never, 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 ever quit. Well, you know what? I've said that a thousand times. I come to find out that he really didn't do that. Amen? I, I learned later, I went back and I began to look through this thing and begin to study this thing because I've said it, I, I've, I've used that illustration a million times. But this is what he did say. This was happening in 1941, October the 29th. He was speaking at... Harold Boys School. It was more like a like a like a boy college or preparing guys for the military or whatever. He said, never give in, never give in, never, 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 in nothing great or small, large or pretty, never give in except to conviction of honor and good sense. Never yield to force, never yield to the apparently overwhelming might of the enemy. Never give in to the enemy. Amen? And so, that being said, I, my title of my message is Never Give Up. Amen? Amen? Never, ever give up. Never stop. Because the enemy would try to do everything he can to stop you. Now, David speaks about commitment, and this is what he says in 37.3. He says, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. You know we need to feed on the faithfulness of God? Amen. God's faithfulness will feed us, Right? He says, delight yourself also in the Lord. He shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. Now, let's keep reading, because you've got to see these things. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice at the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Now, here we go. Do not fret because of him who prosper in his ways. Amen? Don't worry about it. If you see somebody else, something happening. They're, they're, look, if they're not living right, and all of a sudden you see blessings coming in their life, don't fret. Yes, come on Amen? Because their time is coming. Amen. Keep going here. He says, rest in the law, wait patiently on them. Do not fret on those who prosper in the ways because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It only causes harm. Yes, For evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. That's the promise of God. Amen? The meek shall inherit the earth. Now, we learn early on when Moses was getting out of the way and Joshua was taken over, the first thing that God began to talk about Joshua is telling Joshua, don't be dismayed, don't be discouraged, don't give up. Because, see, discouragement causes people to give up. 
Now, if I asked today for a show of hands, I'd be willing to say if I was a betting man, I'd get 100%. If I asked how many people in this place has ever been discouraged? Now, if you've never been discouraged, I want to meet you. Amen? Amen. I need to know you. You've got, you're, you're smoking something. Amen? <laughs> because I believe at some level, all of us at some point has been discouraged. Amen? Amen? I said this morning, my wife wasn't here. I said, if you've been married, you've been discouraged. Amen? Come on. If you've got teenagers, you've been discouraged. Amen? Amen. Not everybody's perfect. <laughs> Jesus is like, how am I supposed to take that? I don't know. It came across a little better when you weren't here this morning. I said that. Amen. Amen. If you marry a beautiful woman like me, you never get discouraged. Now that sound better? Now I'm going to teach you about lying. Amen. <laughs> We've all been discouraged. Okay. He says here, he says, be strong, be courageous, that you may observe uh, to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, has commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. And he goes on to say, The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. We need to know what the Word of God says. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. Can I say that again? Listen, please. You know, sometimes I get worried about putting the Scriptures up here. And I'll tell you why. Because people don't have Bibles anymore. Now, I know most of you probably read your Bible on your iPhone or your iPad, and that's cool too. I'm just telling you, stay with your Bible. Get your word in you, man. Look, every day, get a little dose of that word. Because he says, if we, don't, if, we, if we keep the word inside of us, we'll do a lot better. He says, meditate. He goes on to say, meditate on a day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then, for then, when you do that, will make your way prosperous. And then you will have good success. He says, have not command you. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be dismayed. D Amen? For the Lord God is with you wherever you go. Now, he also reminds him early on, he says, he's listening, he says, all your life, no one will be able to hold out against you in the same way I was with Moses. In other words, look, the same way I was with Moses, and nobody mess with Moses, they won't mess with you either. Amen? Amen? Amen. Because God is their king, he's their protector, their Lord. This is what he says. In the same way I was with Moses, I'll be with you also. He says, I won't give up on you. I won't leave you. Now, that's a promise from God. Amen. And that's a promise we need to hold on to. He says, I'm not going to give up on you. I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to abandon you. He said, the same way I was with Moses, I'm going to be with you. Can I tell you something? The same way he was with Joshua, he's going to be with you. Amen. Amen? Amen? When we meditate on the word of God and we do what God says to do, the same word that he promised him, he promises you and I. Y'all missing out on something. I am not getting enough amens. Amen? We need to look. We need to understand that this word is for us today. And when we read the word of God and we understand the word of God and when we do what the word of God says, we will be blessed. Amen. Right? Amen. Goes on to say, let's keep going here. Now, he says, you know, he'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. Even Psalms, David says this, be brave, be strong, don't give up. And then he says right past that, expect God to get here soon. In other words, listen, when you're going through something, just expect God to show up. Amen. He's going to be here any minute. When you, when you, at the, when your last place, when you, and you, your fingers are fixed to slip off the rope, you're fixing to let go. Listen, just hang on for one more second. God's going to show up. Amen. Amen? He'll be there, expecting to be there, he says. Jeremiah says, don't lose hope. Don't give up. He says, when the rumors pour in hot and heavy, now this is good, okay? When the rumors pour in hot and heavy, can I tell you something? You ever had rumors about you? Yeah. Amen? Now, I can say for sure I've had rumors about me. Amen? Because, see, when we understand, listen, when people are going to talk about you, hang in. Don't give up. They're going to talk about you. They're going to say, I can imagine right now, you probably your neighbors are going, there they go again, they're going off to that church. Can you believe it? Man, it's football Sunday, they're going to church. And they're probably giving money. Can you believe that? I mean, they're going to talk about you. Can I tell you something? Don't worry about those things. It's going to be okay. Never give up. Don't let, let your, your enemy sidetrack you. Amen? Amen? He even says, he says, he goes on to say, one year is this, the next year is that. Rumors of violence, rumors of wars. He says, trust me, the time is coming. Trust him. The time is coming. We need to trust him. Now, Timothy says this. He said, the Spirit makes it clear that as times go on, some are going to give up the faith. That's what it says. Now, you know what? 17 years of pastor, this scripture becomes really true to me. Because I can look around this room and I can remember people that were so faithful, you know, waving their hands and saying, God's good, God is great. All of a sudden something happens. Maybe somebody said something about him. Maybe a little rumor happened about him. Maybe something just happened. Maybe you don't see him anymore. Okay? And see, listen, don't, let, don't, don't become a statistic. 
Don't be that one that says, you know what, he's talking to me. Don't let me talk to you like that. Amen? Be, be, that, be that one that says, you know what, I don't care what happens. I'm going to serve God. I'm going to fight for God. Because, see, whenever you hear something being said, you've got to remember the person saying it. They're just people. And people are going to be people, and people will make mistakes. The day you think that somebody don't make a mistake is the day you think that somebody's wrong. Amen? They will make mistakes. People's going to be people. And Timothy says it. He says, be clear. He says, time is going on. He says, people will give up their faith and chase after demonic illusions. And he says, they chase after demonic illusions put forth by professional liars. Now, they're professional liars. Amen? Now, let me just say this so everybody's clear. Okay? When somebody begins to try to deceive you, you know why they try to do that? Because they themselves are deceived. Amen? Amen? When somebody tries to deceive you, they themselves are deceived. Because, listen, if they weren't deceived, then they would be talking about the truth. So they're deceived themselves. He goes on to say, he says, he says, these liars have lied so well and for so long that they lose their capability for the truth. They, they lose all truth, capacity for truth. Amen? They'll believe their own lie. You ever heard somebody just says, you know, I've been telling it for so long, I just believe it? Huh? They just believe their own lie. My mom used to say one time, my friend used to always say, Miss Gannon, you sure are pretty. And then my mom told one time, she said, you know, I know Johnny's lying when he says that, but, but I believe it. Amen? <laughs> Amen. It's okay. You know, he's probably lying, but I believe it. Amen? Amen. It's all right. Some of you believe your own lies. God's word and our prayers to make every item in created creation holy. He says, you've been raised on the message of the faith and have been followed sound doctrine. Now pass on this counsel. In other words, listen, as you get by and as you fulfill and as you don't give up, as you beat the battle, so to speak, as you make it to the other side of it, help other people. Amen. Help other people get to the same place you got to. You know, my heart breaks sometimes when you see somebody who's been through the mud and all of a sudden somebody else falls in the mud and they're quick to say how dirty they are. They're quick to point out, look how filthy they are. They just didn't realize it. They just got hosed off themselves. Amen? Listen, we need to come to a place where, you know what? If you're here this morning, you've got to know this. God's not mad at you. God loves you, and God loves you the same as he loves me. Come on. Sometimes we say, well, well, well God must love him more than he loves me. God loves all of us. He's not a respecter of persons. We understand that God does. He goes on to say all these things. He says, uh, Christians, there are, uh, uh, in other words, he's talking about being a good servant. He says, stay clear of silly stories that get dressed up in religion. That's kind of interesting. This is a mes- message that's talking about this. Amen? He goes on to say, uh, get the word out. Teach all these things, and don't let anyone put you down because you're young. I'm talking to Timothy. Look, just because you're young as a believer today, don't let anybody put you down. And here's, here's what I've seen before, okay? I've seen some people who's been in church forever, and all of a sudden a young person comes and gets saved, and they get all rowdy, all excited, and that old person's going, oh, just give them a little time, they're going to settle down. Don't let them settle down. Yeah, Don't put them down. Amen? Let them stay riled up. Let them stay fired up. Amen. He says, let anyone put down the young. He says, teach believers with your life, by word, by dominion, by love, by faith, by integrity. In other words, you've got to walk this thing out. Yeah. Cultivate these things. Emerge yourself into them. In other words, dive in. Jump in with both feet, all right? Now, I understand today, I understand that the time is short, and I understand that as time is short, people will give up, all right? I, I've seen it. I, 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 I don't want to see it anymore. And so I'm, hopefully I'm teaching you something today. Hopefully I'm going to learn you something, amen? I want to learn you something today to keep you from giving up because there's everything in, in, in me to see people make it. I want to see people make it to the other side. I want to see people get through it. I want to see people who come to me and say, Pastor, because of something you said, I've been married now for 50 years. Because of something you said, my wife and I was fixing to throw in the towel. Something you said, we restored our marriage. Our kids are being saved. Our, our, our life is being changed. Why? Because, listen, it's important that we teach people by our actions. Amen? When you see me up here with my wife, and I got my arm around her, and I'm whispering in her ear, and I'm holding her hand, I'm not putting on a show. Okay? I'm showing these things because I love this woman. Amen? I, 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 I'd rather spend time with her than any one of you. Amen? Amen. She kisses better than you do. Amen? Amen? Why? Because I love her. And I enjoy her. You know what? And guess what? You should do the same with the one you're with. Amen. Instead of just constantly just complaining and whining and wishing you with somebody else, 
Well, I said that out loud, didn't I? Time is short. It's, it's time to not give up. What are some of the ways we might help keep us from quitting or giving up? You ready for this one? This is important. Now, sometimes when I read these things, I said this morning in the first service, sometimes when I feel like I'm preparing a message and sometimes I feel like the Spirit of the Lord gives me a certain word and I write it down, I, I, I sometimes look at it and think, well, that might be a little elementary. But you know what? We need the elementary sometimes. Sometimes we, we think that we, we know so much and we really got to get back to the basis. And so here's, here's a very clear word for you this morning. You ready? It's simply this. You keep from giving up when you get involved or you get, you get involved in fellowship. You need to be involved in fellowship. This is what the Bible says in Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promises faithful. When somebody tells me I don't need fellowship, oh, they're lying. I, I, I will tell you in a heartbeat, they're lying. Well, you don't have to have fellowship to go to heaven. That's true. That's true. Technicality, that's true. But I tell you what, man, it's going to make it a whole lot easier getting there. Amen. When you got somebody alongside of you, give you a little fellowship. He says, goes on to say, he says, For he who promises faithful, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as in the manner of some, some do, but exalt one another, Amen. and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Amen. Now, my wife read a little story to me, and she might have put it on, on the Internet. And if you didn't read it or don't know anything about it, I'm going to tell you. I thought it was one of those, those little stories that really spoke to me. There was a story about a pastor, and he went to a brother in the church that had been out of fellowship for some period of time. And he went to the brother's house, and he knocked on the door, and the brother answered the door, and he walked inside. He was invited inside. And it must have been during the winter time because the fireplace was going. And when the pastor came in, he took a set of, uh, careful how I say this word, tongs. I don't want to say the wrong one, amen? I'm, I'm good at saying the wrong word. <laughs> it's Cajun. Sometimes I, my phonics are a little different. I spell phonics with an F, Amen. Some of you didn't even laugh because you think you spell it too the same way, probably. <laughs> but he took the tongs and he reached down and he grabbed the uh, uh, ember. It was red hot. And he took it out of the fire and he laid it on the side of the mantle outside the fire. And he laid it there and the pastor just sat down. And him and the guy just sat there. And I don't think many words were being said. Not much was being said. He just kind of sat there. And as he sat there, he realized... That, that piece of coal or that, that hot ember, amber, ember that he took out was beginning to just kind of get cold. And so he reached over and he grabbed those tongs again and he grabbed that ember and he put it back in the fire and all of a sudden that ember just got red hot. And all of a sudden the guy looked at the pastor and he said, that is the best message you ever preached about the need for church and fellowship. Amen. Now, some of you might have missed it. Because, see, when we're out of the fellowship, we get cold. Amen. But when we're back in the fellowship, yes. Amen. we get stirred up. Yes. If anybody in this place has a fireplace, you know during the night sometimes it gets a little, goes down. But the next morning, you start blowing a little fresh air onto it, throw a little wood inside of it. Next you know, you got a blazing fire again. See, that's what fellowship does to you and I. When we're in fellowship, look, when you're cold, you quit. When you're cold, you want to throw in the towel. When you're cold, you want to give up. Oh, well, well, you're just trying to get us to come to church. That I am. Amen. That I am. Why? Because it's important. You know, I, I told a guy one time, a guy says, well, I don't need church. And I said, well, let me ask you a question. Do you believe the church was a gift from, from Christ, from God? I said, yeah, it was a gift. I said, well, look, between you and I, when you get to heaven, you tell Christ that you didn't like his gift. You tell him that you didn't care much for his gift. Because, see, when you read the scripture and he says, beware, watch out, you need, don't forsake. He gives us all these warnings. You know what they mean? Look out, beware, don't forsake. I mean, don't try to read some great philosopher. Well, I wonder what he's trying to say here. He's trying to say, look out, beware. 
Why? Because the Bible speaks simply to a simple-minded person. Thank God for that. Amen? If He didn't speak to simple-minded people, then I'd be in trouble. But He's trying to just warn us. You see, what happens is, is we get out of fellowship and the idle mind starts working. And when that idle mind kicks in, man, you, you can't believe what's starting to, starting to fly. I mean, you start thinking of all kinds of stuff. Amen? There's probably people at home right now thinking I'm preaching about them. Amen? Really. I'm just being honest. You know, some people, when they're out of fellowship, they immediately think, well, he's talking about me. I, I, I've had people in the church come up to me afterwards. Well, I get the message. Talk, I didn't even know you were here, you know? <laughs> And the truth is what I want to say is don't flatter yourself, honey. I don't think that much about you, you know? You, you know what I mean? Because, see, that's the Spirit of the Lord speaking. God does those things. It's not me. But, see, when God speaks, He's trying to get all our attention. When I'm preaching on Sunday morning, I might be looking at you, but I'm speaking to me. Why? Because I need it just as much as you do. And the truth is, hopefully, I, I hope you need me, but I want to tell you the honest truth. I need you. Roger, I need you. You know, I need Rod, I need Jane, I need you. Why? Because we need each other. Amen. And in the body of Christ, God gave us each other and says, listen, I want, you, I want you to have this time together where you can find that fellowship so when Sister Big Bottoms are falling apart, you know, she needs help. Amen? Amen. Our brother do nothing or whatever you want to call him. Amen? We all need help. Amen. Every one of us. I don't care what situation you're in. Every one of us needs some help. Whew. I got through that one. Amen? Amen. Here's the next one. Here's the next one, okay? Now, I used this illustration sometime probably several months ago, but I feel like it's important to use it again. We won't give up when we trust that nothing is impossible for God. Nothing is impossible. Luke 137, for with God, nothing will be impossible. Luke 18, 27, but he said the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Now, I will tell you, you know, Julie and I going through this surgery, and, and we were kind of worried about some things and concerned about some things and, you know, wasn't sure what the outcome was and all that stuff. But as, as a concern as I was, I knew everything was going to be okay. Yeah. Now, how is that so? Because nothing's impossible for God. And when we understand that, listen, God's way is not our way. We don't lean on our understanding. If somebody tells me, well, well we were praying for sister so-and-so or brother so-and-so, and they died, God didn't heal them. Listen, if they're saved, they're healed. Amen? Amen. Amen. I, I don't know the sovereignty of God. I don't know why God does what he does. When people ask me, well, why does this happen? Why does that? Well, if you know, man, you, you're smarter than I am. Because I don't know. I don't know why some of these things happen. I don't understand why some of the things happen. All I know is I trust God and nothing's impossible for him. If God said it, it's got to be true. Amen. Amen? Listen, we need to get to the place where we believe what the Word says. We need to get to a place where God says, listen, if you trust me in these things, listen, everything's going to be okay. I, I, I tell this story because it became so real to me. I'm talking about just the Word of God and nothing being impossible. You know, when we were in Russia, and, and I remember this guy walking up to me in, in the marketplace, and he said to me, he said, Espinite Bajosta. He said, excuse me, please. He said, Adin. He was asking for one. He said, Clear Bajosta. Clear Bajosta. He was asking for bread. And all of a sudden, man, that word became so real to me, and I realized that what the Bible says is I've never seen the righteous forsaken or seed begging bread. Because here's a guy who's living in a place that wasn't built on in God we trust. Are you getting this? And so when we win a place where we built on, listen, in God we trust, there's nothing impossible for God. You might look outside, and, and we all do, and we all have, and we see some things happening in, in our country today, and we see things happening in the government today, and we see all these things happening, and we're all freaking out, and we're all falling apart. But I want you to know something. Nothing is impossible for God. We might look and we might not understand and we might not be pleased and we might not like it the way it's happening and we, we share our opinion about it, but there's nothing impossible for God. When you put God first in your life and in God we trust, listen, God still shows up and God's still on the throne. And listen, he's sitting down, not because he's tired, but because he's in total control. That's the God that we serve. Nothing's impossible. Here's the next one. Here's the next one. You got to hear this one because this was important. People give up when they play the role of a victim and not victorious. There are too many times when people constantly want to be the victim. People are professional victims. I'm telling you this with my eyes closed so I don't want anybody to think I'm looking at them. Amen? And don't nudge the person next to you. Okay? 
Because there are people that are, that are really good at playing the victim. They're constantly, oh, poor pitiful me. Oh, poor pitiful, oh, oh everybody's happy, I'm not happy. I'm this, I'm that, this, 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 this. just shut up. <laughs> Begin to get victorious. God wants you to be victorious, as my wife says. Put your big girl panties on, amen? Quit being just a victim, constantly being victim. Oh, it's, it's, oh, the world is against me. <laughs> Proverbs says this. He says, my son. Now, he uses the terms harlot and seduction, seductress, okay? He says, my son, give me your heart and let your eyes observe my ways. For a harlot is a deep pit. Now, listen to me. When he's talking about things here, he's talking about the enemy. He's talking about the seduction of the enemy, okay? Because, see, the seduction of the enemy can make things, they can pull you right in, okay? Now, he references this because he's using a harlot and he's using the word seduction. But listen, there's all kinds of things that can just pull you right in. Amen? Looks good on the outside. He's pulling you right in. And he goes on to say, is a narrow well. The seduction is a narrow well. Now, I hate to say this, and God forgive me for saying this, but he uses it to cause all the things, and it says, she. <laughs> but anyway... Also lies in wait, <laughs> as, forgive me, okay? She also lies in wait as for a victim and increases the unfaithful among men. In other words, listen, the, the unfaithfulness of the victim mentality is lying in wait for you, okay? And you've got to fight against that thing because this is what he says in 1 Corinthians 15, 54. So when this, so when, so when this corruption has put on incorruption and this moral has put in mortality, then shall be bought to both, I'm sorry, then shall be brought to pass the saying that's, that's written. Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O hell, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who does what? Who gives us the victory. How? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brother, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Now, First John says this in 5.4. It says, for whatever, born, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world. What? Our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world, but he who believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now, again, he says here, O hell, where is thy victory? Now, let me tell you something. Early on, we learn where he said, Peter, Peter, he says, I'm gonna, on, on this rock, I'm going to build my church. And the gates of hell won't what? Prevail. Okay? And so with victory in Christ Jesus, listen, the gates of hell cannot prevail. Greater is a God that dwells inside of you than he's in the world. You must believe that. Listen, whenever you allow the enemy to make you a victim, here's the reality. You ready for this? The world will convince you that it's okay to be a victim. Yes, the world will say, well, bless your heart, honey. You know, it's okay, sweetie. You know, you're just a victim of society. You're just a victim. You know, your parents didn't give you nothing. You're just a victim of this. You're a victim of this. You're a vic victim of that. Listen, that's a lie from the pits of hell. You see, I could have bought into that. I could have easily bought into that. My, my mom was raised on a on a farm. She didn't have but a seventh grade education. My dad was raised on a houseboat. You know, I could have easily bought into, well, you know, I just come from a, from a, a, a poor, dumb background. I don't have to have any, I don't have to do any of these things. And I could have bought into that. You see what I'm saying? Instead, you know, sometimes you've got to come outside ourselves and do some other things. See, those who don't know me, when I was in business, they used to take these evaluation tests. And every time they took these evaluation tests on me, it came back that I was an introvert. Now, some of you look and say, well, you don't look like an introvert. You stand up there and preach it. But deep down inside, give me a book. Leave me alone. I'm good. I'm just being honest. I can hide. I really could. And so sometimes you've got to come out of sight of that to be victorious. Because sometimes the enemy will trap you within yourselves. And you begin to buy into those things. Because, listen, society says it. This, this test says it. People are saying it. So it must be true. That's why, listen, let me tell you something. If I ever catch you, and, and I don't say this too often, but as a pastor and as a, as, a, as a dad and as a grandfather, don't ever let me catch you calling your kids stupid or dumb or whatever. Don't ever do that. Don't ever say, well, you dummy or you stupid or you whatever. Look, that is horrible. 
Why? Because if you're not careful, you're going to speak that into their life, and they're going to buy into, well, I'm just dumb. That's why I'm a victim. You know, I, I'm, I'm just stupid. That's why I can't never do anything in school. I'm just a victim. They buy into the victim mentality. You cannot buy into that. You must be overcomers. God will allow us all to be overcomers. Caleb said it today, by the word of our testimony, amen? And by the blood of the Lamb. Now, here's another one here, and I want to hit this one, and I, when I say it, <clears throat> I'm going to read it one way, but I want you to understand what I'm trying to bring across. <clears throat> talking about not giving up. When we encourage others, we ourselves get encouraged. Amen. Now, this is what he says in, in, in 1 Thessalonians 3, 5. He says, therefore, when we could no longer endure it, we thought it to be good, and we left in, 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 in Athens alone and sent Timothy, our brother, a ministry of God, and a fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to do what? To establish you and to encourage concerning your faith. Okay? Now, he's talking about this. He's talking about sending a brother to establish. Now, this is the part here I want you to see. All right? Now, I said to you, to, we, we, we encourage others and ourself become encouraged. This is a law of sowing and reaping. This is a law of sowing and reaping. Now, let's look what it says here. It says here in, in uh, um, I'm sorry, over here. In Galatians 6, it says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever man sow, that he will also reap. If he sows to the flesh, will the flesh reap corruption? But if he sows to the Spirit, will the Spirit reap everlasting? Verse 9. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially those in the household of faith. Now, let's go back, okay? Now, immediately, when someone says sowing and reaping, the first thing you think about is finances. Don't t tell me that you didn't think that. If you didn't think that, tell me you didn't think that. Because I guarantee you, probably 99% of the people in this room, as soon as you say so, finances, can I tell you, it's more than that? It's more than that. Because, see, the, the sowing and the reaping comes alive with all kinds of things in their life. If I'm going to come encourage you, guess what? God's going to send somebody to encourage me. Or well, are you missing this? Because, see, I'm talking about not giving up. Now, if you're sick this morning, pray for somebody. Pray for somebody's healing. Pray for somebody else to get healed. Listen, I'm telling you, the sowing and the reaping is far beyond any of these things. Now, I will, I will tell you this morning, and, 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 I, and, I, and I need to say, share it with you, not to say, look at me, look at me, look at me, but I want you to understand the principle. Over the years, Julie and I have had the opportunity, we've been blessed enough to give away Several cars, trucks, vans. Um, we give several cars, several trucks, several one van. I remember away. We give a lot, a lot of our vehicles away. God bless us. We've been able to do that. Give it to the people that need it. I give it to a pastor's wife. I give it to different ones. I give people in church. I had given the vehicles to. Now, I, don't come looking for my truck because that's my truck is new. I don't. You ain't getting it, amen. Bless <laughs> God speaks to me. But but I say that because let me share this with you. Okay, as I have given those things away in times past, I will tell you, over the years, as my boys were growing up, you wouldn't believe the vehicles when we needed got given to us. Now, every one of my boys can tell you they've, they've been given a vehicle. Some of them are driving them now. I'm just telling you, over the years, as we sowed into other people by being an, an opportunity to give something away because we had something. God says he give it away. We gave it away. God was able to give back in our time of need. Amen. Now, let me tell you something. I, I said that because I want to go back to the encouraging part. You might be here today. You, look, you might walk in this place all blowed up. You might walk in this place mad, at, mad at, at, as a hornet because somebody didn't encourage you. But I'm going to tell you this morning, if you learn to encourage others, you yourself will be encouraged. Amen. Amen. And all these principles, when you pour into other people's life in ways, listen, God has to pour back the same way. Amen. 
He is a God of principle. He is not a God. He is not a man that he can lie. If he said it, you got to believe it. See, we struggle. We still str we're still struggling with the sowing and the reaping because TV has perverted it. I'm just saying it out loud. There have been televangelists that has perverted the, given it, the, the prosperity message. They're all about the money, all about the money, all about the money. Let me tell you something. Is the prosperity message real? It is real. But let me stop for a second. For me, it becomes perverted when prosperity gets ahead of salvation. When it's all about the money, all about the prosperity, listen, there's more to it than that. Because, see, I love the fact that we're full gospel. Because I want to preach all the gospel. I want to talk about all the warnings, all the blessings, all the look at, all the, everything. We need to know what all the package says. Now, we can come up here every Sunday and give you cotton candy. Come on. But you'll, you'll, you'll die of sugar diabetes. Amen? <laughs> <laughs> She's looking away from me when I say it. Yes. Speaking to my chest, old loved one. Some of you may or may not know, we, um, there's a large house out on Highway 8 that sat empty for eight years. And um, it sat empty for eight years because nobody could afford to buy the house. It was a white elephant in town pretty much. And um, my husband and I, God has given us the gift of hospitality. And from the day we married, we've, we've given away vehicles. We've taken people into our home. You can ask our kids. We take people into our home. Um, some people thought we were crazy. We've taken in crackheads and alcoholics and you name it. We've taken them in. And we've loved them. And God set them free. And God's done great works in their life. And I'm not saying that to pat myself on the back or anything like that. I'm just saying God gives you the grace to do what he's called you to do. And if you're obedient, he will bless your obedience. And I've said that to say this. Three years ago, we looked at this house on Highway 8. And the minute we walked in the house, I told Pastor, I said, they're not going to sell this house because this house is supposed to be ours. And he looked at me and rolled his eyes, and he said, Yeah, baby, that's all fine and good. You just keep dreaming there, okay? And, um, but when I walked in the house, what I saw was I saw her pastor sitting around our dining room table being loved on and being ministered to, and I saw people being brought into our home and restored. So we looked at it. And we made an offer on the house, and we told people, look, we know the house is worth a lot more than we can afford to pay for it, but this is where we're at, and no hard feelings. You know, if you can't do it, no hard feelings. You need a lot of repair on it, too. And, and it needed some repairs. Like I said, been empty a long time. And God shut the door. And so for two years, every time we'd pass that house on Highway 8, I'd say, that's our house. Isn't it pretty? <laughs> And he would roll his eyes at me, <laughs> say, baby, I, I'm glad you have faith to believe for that, but I'm just not there yet. And one day out of the blue, the owners of the house called him up and said, look, if you want that house, we want your family to have it and we'll sell it to you for what you offered us for it. And in that two-year period, they, had, they had put $80,000 worth of repair in the house and then still sold it to us for what we offered them to it. And I say that to say this, you cannot outgive God. If you are, God blesses you to be a blessing. See, we, we think the blessing is all about us. You understand what I'm saying? We think it's all about us, like, look at what I have. And... And, and look at what we can do. And there was a time in our life when we weren't serving God. We didn't like each other. We were making a whole lot of money. And everything we touched was cursed. We were buying groceries on a credit card. We, we, our marriage was on the rocks. And all I could think of was I wanted my kids to have the best clothes. I wanted to drive the best car. I wanted to live in the best house. And my husband went on a mission trip, and we were getting ready to build the house that we actually built out on 468 ago. 15 years ago. But we were getting ready to build it in South Louisiana. And 
he was in Russia, and I remember just, I was in my quiet time, and I was praying for my husband, and the Lord said to me, he said, would you rather have your husband sold out to me, or would you rather have things at your choice? And that was a no-brainer. And he came home, and he said, honey, I don't think we're supposed to build this house. And I said, you know what? It's okay. God had to do something in me and change my want. You see, we take that scripture, delight yourself in the law of the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. The key to that is delighting in the Lord. When you put God first, he changes your desire. And your desire becomes, God, what is it you want for me? And when your desire is lined up with what he wants, then he gives you the hope to stick it out. He surrounds you with people to encourage you when you're down. You know, God is faithful to his word. And I'm just telling you, you cannot, whether it's time, money, energy, and I know there are people sometimes you feel like are going to suck the life out of you. But you've got to remember there was a time when you were there and God put somebody alongside you. To guide you to the place where you could be that blessing to someone else. Amen. Don't forget where God brought you from. The same comfort you've been comforted with, give it to somebody else. The same hope that somebody else has, has spoken to your life, give it to somebody else. You are blessed to be a blessing. Amen. Amen. I wrote all that for her to say, amen? <laughs> you know, I, I said this before. It, it's okay to have things. Just don't let things have you. And pray for the right reason. You know, if you're praying for a car to show up to your neighbors, you pray for the wrong reasons. <clears throat> if you're praying for a car big enough, Stephen and I talked about this before. He was looking for a vehicle big enough to haul more people to church. That's the right reason. You see what I'm saying? Let's, let's jump to this next one here because I think this is really important. Here's one here that, that you've got to get. And understanding keeps us from giving up. Right. Now, the Bible says in Proverbs 4.4, 4, He also taught me and said to me, Let your heart retain my words, keep my commandments, and live. Get wisdom, get understanding. Do not forget nor turn away from the words of my mouth. Do not forsake her, and she will preserve you. You love her, and she will keep you. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. In all thy get, get understanding. Now, what do you mean by that, Pastor? Now, let me just ask you a question. Have you ever had something that you're doing, and you didn't understand it, and so you quit? Yeah, come on now. Come on. Have you ever been doing something, maybe repairing, maybe doing something, and you didn't have the understanding you needed to complete the task, so you quit? That's the same thing when we're talking about the Word of God. You see, God wants us to have understanding. That's why, listen, that's why we try, when I took uh, 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 hermeneutics or homiletics and stuff in, in college, one of the things they tried us to do is to take the then and the there and place it into the here and the now. Okay? What do you mean by that, Pastor? Well, you can preach about the then and the there and people might not get it, but you place it into the here and the now, they'll begin to understand it. I remember one time I was teaching about how, how David was on the rooftop and he saw Bathsheba and he lusted after her and he sinned in his heart and he, and he wanted her and he had her husband killed and all this kind of stuff. And I just brought it to another level. I said, yeah, there was a soldier, and he was outside washing his car, and his neighbor was washing her car in a bikini. Come on, somebody. And he lusts upon her. You see? We bring the same reality because we look and we say, well, David did that. That's really, that's how. But look, the same situations you're dealing with today. You just got to put it into a different level. And so to get the understanding, you must have it. Because if you don't get it, you look. If you don't know why you do something, you'll quit. If you don't know why church is important, you won't come. If you don't believe that, that there's guardrails you should put in your life,
then you won't ever put them. If you don't believe that you need to court and marry and, and date your wife or your husband, you'll never do it. Now, what do you mean by that, Pastor? Listen, I've been married 32 years. My wife and I still date. Why? Because it's important. It's important that we take our phones and throw them aside. We sit across the table from each other. We make Google eyes at each other. And we begin to have, you know, the, a conversation that we're missing because of life being so busy. Amen. If you've got kids and you tell me, well, i got kids, I can't do it. Listen, that's what fellowship's about. Because fellowship is fellowshipping with other people who have kids. So you can bring your kids to their house and they can bring your kids to your house. That's when you trade off. Well, I can't afford to. Listen, there were times where we just sat at McDonald's and had ice cream cone across from each other. you got to learn these things are important. If you don't understand these things, you will never do them. People who don't understand, give up. Wisdom is the principal thing. But in all that get, get understanding. Because if you don't understand it, you won't do it. We have school teachers. We have people in this place who are educators. You're trying to get your student to understand, not memorize. Let me say it again. You want them to understand it, not just memorize it. Because, see, if you're just memorizing it, when the, when the scenario don't come the same way you memorized it, you don't get it. But if there's an understanding that happens when that scenario takes place, you get it. You understand it. Here's the last one. Is this. We're talking about not giving up. Pray plus praise equals purpose. The Bible says in John 4.23, But the hour is coming and now is. When the two worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. He created us. If somebody says we're not created to worship, you, you don't listen to them. That's, that's a, never mind. God is spirit and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. Bible says pray without ceasing. What it means is don't ever stop praying. Bible says in Psalms, I will pray, pray without, I will praise you for I am wonderfully, fearfully, and wonderfully made. Come on. Romans says, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to what? His purpose. And so when we pray and praise, it equals purpose in our life. You must have purpose. People without purpose, people without a vision, perish. One of the first questions I ask people when they come into my office after I pray, tell me, how's your prayer life? Well, Pastor, I'm really not praying. <laughs> Here's your sign. <laughs> because it's important. You, 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 you got to pray, and, and, and let me just say this about praise. Worship is not just a slow song. Worship is much more than that. Worship is when you say, God, you're everything. God, without you, I have no marriage. God, without you, I, I can't do anything. But God, with you. Oh, with you, God, I can do all things. Amen. There's a story about a guy that was in the Olympics. About 22 years ago, it was in the 92 Olympics in Barcelona. <clears throat> now, he was forced to not compete in the 80 Olympics in Seoul because of an injury. Achilles and his, his tenor, he, he heard it. His, he was a runner. But now he's in great shape, and he's, and he's probably, he's really picked to win in Barcelona, to win the 400-meter dash. He won the first quarter, and now he's moving to the semifinals. He starts the race, and he ran for about 150 meters. All of a sudden, his hamstring just snapped. 
He stopped running and he fell to the ground and he's in so much agony and so much pain. After a few seconds laying on the ground, he remembered where he was and he got back up and he continued the race. Unable to run, he hobbled. The other competitors had finished, but this guy, Derek, uh, Derek Redmond, he didn't stop. Even though all the competitors was over, he, he, he just wanted to finish. Now, a man fought his way past the security, and he ran out to the track toward Derek. It was his father, Jim Redmond. And he told Derek, stop, stop right here. He says, you, you don't have anything to prove. You, you, you hurt yourself. Don't run anymore. And Derek replied and told him, that he did. His father helped him get up back into his lane and Derek hobbled and finished despite the injury of the hands, despite all the pain he had, he finished. There was a crowd of 65,000 people who stood to their feet and they gave him a standing ovation. Even though Derek was officially disqualified and the Olympic record stated that he did not finish the race, he finished it better than anyone else on that track. And to this day, most people won't remember who won that race. But they'll remember the guy who finished it, who fought his way through it. Never, ever, ever give up. Father, we thank you for this time with our brothers and sisters and friends. And God, we ask you to speak to our hearts today. And God, maybe there's someone here today, for whatever reason, this message is tugged at their heart. Maybe for whatever reason, they, they feel like they just need to quit, need to give up. Maybe something was said that just really stirred them. God, you know all these things. I don't know. All I know, God, is you want me to pray for them. So if you're here this morning, and this is you, I don't know your circumstance, don't know the situation, don't know what God spoke to you about. But I want to pray for you. If you're here this morning and you need that prayer, right where you're at, I'm not going to embarrass you or call you out. Just raise your hand. I just want to pray for you. Just raise your hand. I see those hands. I see those hands. I see those hands. Anyone else? I just want to pray for you. I see that hand. Anyone else? I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. Anyone else? I just want to pray for you. Just encourage you. I see those hands. I see that hand. Anyone else? Don't want to miss an opportunity to pray for you. Thank you, Jesus. I see that hand. Father, I thank you right now that God, all through the Scripture, you refer to us as a race. And God, we know that we don't run a sprint. We run a marathon. God, I pray today that something that was said will stir in the hearts of every man, woman, and child in this place. And God, I pray today that you will stir them to never, ever quit, never give up, never stop, to complete the task that is set before them. God, I thank you that you're going to give them strength, wisdom, understanding. God, I thank you that all things they stand in need of, you're a God that provides. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, Pastor, I don't know Jesus as my Savior. Or maybe you're here this morning and you say, Pastor... There was a time I was serving the Lord. I just realized I'm backslidden. I want to get that right. We're right there between you and God. You pray this prayer from the heart. Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Jesus, I repent where I failed you. Jesus, save my soul. Jesus, I want to make you my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, you're my King and my Savior, my Lord, my Master. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Maybe you prayed that prayer for the first time. Or maybe it's a prayer of rededication. Again, I'm not here to judge you or, or call you out. I just want to pray for you. You prayed that prayer this morning. Right where you at, just raise your hand and put it back down. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see those hands. I see those hands. Anyone else? I just want to pray for you. I see that hand. I see those hands. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. God, I thank you for your salvation. God, I thank you for your understanding. God, I pray blessings. God, I pray when we leave this place today that we know that we've been in your presence and, God, that we got a glimpse of your glory and, God, we got a glimpse of your understanding and, God, that we'll know exactly how to when those times come and what to do. 
God, you're a God that don't leave us hanging. God, you're a God that explains all things to the simple. And God, I thank you for that. Now, blessings be upon every man, woman, and child in this place as we honor you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you receive that word, let's give God a hand. Amen.